Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our first breakout session of the day. My name is Christopher Biggs. I will be the session chair here this morning. Um, I'm the uh, convener of the Brisbane Internet of Things meetup group, so the topic this morning is uh, of great interest to me. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and paying my respects to elders past and present. Um, this morning we have Neil Armstrong, who has been a Linux engineer since 2008 and has done a great deal of work towards porting and maintaining Linux on ARM and various FPGAs. And this morning he'll be talking about the device tree component within the, the Linux on ARM uh, subsystem. So please join me in welcoming Neil. <coughs> Now, thank you for attending. Uh, so my talk will be towards uh, the history of the base tree for the past, present, and future in three parts. Um, I'm working for the a French engineering company called Baylib. We are specialized in every open source uh, components in embedded systems, so Linux, RTOS, and so on. Doesn't work. Okay. So. First of all, DevS3, what does it come? What is the history of DevS3? It's a long history because it's always been uh, an issue for engineers to, to um, find a way to describe the hardware, uh, the different hardware and different variants of hardware for a software purpose. So uh, you can use code, uh, you can use a proper binary format, you can use a proper text format, you can use auto-generated uh, uh, format from uh, Verilog or VHDL, for example. So there is plenty of money to do, but <coughs> you somehow need to be to find a genetic way and a portable way for the future, future proof uh, software support. So let's start with a classic system architecture to, to see what we need to describe from a device tree perspective. So it's a highly simplified uh, architecture uh, point of view. You have a, a CPU, which uh, executes some instruction, which will, be, will do some uh, um, um, memory fetches on the bus. And historically, you had a common bus to access to the WAM, the memory behind the memory controller, and all the various peripherals like Ethernet, serial ports, adapters, and uh, interface extensions like PCI, PCI Express, EASX, for graphics, for example. So I won't speak about the pro and cons of architectures. You have, for example, the Intel classical architecture with uh, North Bridge, South Bridge, like you see, it's similar. You still have a bus, you still have uh, a memory bus, you still have, you need to, uh, to access through this bus to access the memory and all the peripherals, like a more modern way of uh, uh, doing hardware today, which groups everything, in form of, for example, in the controller and move all the memory in the main CPU but it's still uh, multiple buses going from the CPU to access memory, WAMs, and all the peripherals. So it doesn't change a lot, even if it's organized differently between the chips on the board. So multiple solutions were found in the past. So uh, you had uh, ACPI tables for the all the Intel world. Uh, and you had another solution with open firmware in the Spark and PowerPC world. So both solutions had the same goal, to, to describe the hardware in a genetic, in a genetic way uh, that can be parsed and interpreted by a software, a genetic software, um, to be able to have a generic implementation for uh, multiple boards. So, way SAPA was designed by, designed by Microsoft Intel for various architecture on Windows NT, for example. Uh, it was really, really used to tight control on the PC uh, world, which is an open world, which is quite strange. 
and on the other side, the best tree was used to uh, retain and by engineers for more open hardware and more open platforms out of the PC world. So let's start to dig in, into the specifications. So the first specifications of something called device tree was in the I3E12675 specification in 1994. So they describe device tree is a set to describe a set of devices attached to the system uh, with a data structure known as a device tree. And it's a set of devices in property list and nodes. So, so it is the basis of device tree and it was formally specified in 1994. And uh, later, one or later, the PowerPC Common Machine Preference Platform specified DT for the PowerPC platform. Uh, so it was developed by Apple, uh, IBM, and Motorola for the platforms at the time. And it was uh, an extension of the i3e uh, specification for PowerPC. Uh, later on, in 2008, you had a um, Power Org standard for embedded power architecture platform requirements, which specified device tree in a more formal way. Uh, and this was the base specification used for Linux, for example, to start the support of the device tree. So it's clearly specified in the specification, so it's loosely related to the E3 specification because you cannot, because the nature of embedded systems is too complex to, to use very generic description like it was described in the E3E specification. So this is why there is a lot of variants that need to be specified. So you had multiple implementations of these uh, uh, specifications. So you have the famous open uh, firmware um, specification that was implemented in the Sun on Spark systems and use the rest tree to describe the hardware, the underlying hardware. Um, then Apple adopted open firmware on the, on the Macs uh, in 1995. And uh, they dropped the rest tree for ACP table when they switched to the Intel CPUs. But they still use a device tree form on all the iPhones and the iDevices. Uh, which, which are running their own uh, ARM-based uh, SOCs. Uh, on the old Macs, the PC devices were generated by uh, device by firmware. So it's, it's still the case of today how to describe the hot pluggable devices like PCI, PCI Express, and USB. So you can do it, and I think Apple had the same, had the same issue in 1995, actually. So, a brief history of device tree support in operating systems, Linux. Uh, so, in 2005, you had the first uh, support code uh, for PowerPC. Um, in 2006, you have the first device tree file in the code base. And, for example, in 2007, you have the initial <coughs> PS3 support, Sony PlayStation 3 support. Really, really basic, only one node. And uh, you started to have a common device tree implementation in the drivers OF, which is still used today. Uh, and you had multiple switches to device tree, like the open uh, microblaze and then uh, ARM, or the ARM board started to switch in uh, 2011. Uh, it was a long discussion because uh, at the time, everything was described in C and it was really hard to maintain. And it was a hard decision to switch to device tree. And uh, in uh, 2014, it was used, used by 12, 12 architecture, which is quite a lot. So today, how it's used and uh, where it's used. For the start, Today we have a new specification which is based on the power, power specification 
which is led by ARM, Linaro, uh, and NXP, and IBM, which goal is to have an external specification not tied to a platform, and then that, that, that it manage like an open source project, and uh, it's adapted to current and future hardware. So they take into account all the specific specificities, specificities, for example, of the ARM platforms. And uh, the zero the two uh, version was tagged in uh, half uh, September, half of de December. And uh, there is a, a community work, so you have a mailing list, you have uh, statuses, and uh, a full GitHub uh, community behind this. So it's good to have. Uh, more understanding of how the device tree today is specified. So today, in 4.15, which is not tag tagged, maybe on, hopefully in, on, on a Sunday, uh, is supported in 14 architecture, so the classical ARM, ARM64, PowerPC, and two Intel boards, which is funny. Um, so it's mandatory to, for, for new boards on the majority of architecture, for example, ARM and ARM64. Um, how much board we support today? On ARM, you have uh, nearly 1,000 boards. ARM64 is g gaining more support because there's less boards on the market. Uh, overall, we have nearly 1,100 1, ARM boards supported, partially supported in the kernel, which is quite a lot. And I didn't put the graph, but uh, the number of bo supported boards uh, was exponential when uh, they switched to, um, to the device tree in the ARM world, because it, it is much simpler, and you can describe, describe more variants more easily. So for the BSD world, you have the free BSDs which support the device tree and they take all the bindings and the Linux and the device tree files, so they don't have a lot of issues taking stuff from Linux, because usually the device tree files are dually li licensed, uh, not only GPL, so you can u use them on a non-GPL uh, project. But NetBSD uh, have a lot of issues about the Linuxism of today's device tree files, because uh, a lot of structure and a lot of uh, naming in the properties was, uh, we, we can't avoid it, but they are tied to how Linux is designed. Uh, U-Boot supports uh, device tree. It's, it's a core component because uh, they switched to the driver model uh, a few years ago, which is a, a trimmed down version of the, of, um, of the Linux driver model which can use the device tree to actually load uh, the devices. So you don't need to write all of the peripherals in C anymore. And like Linux, uh, it's done uh, dynamically, so it's really good. And they leverage all the binary uh, feature of the device tree to store uh, the boot image. So it's, the name is fit image. Uh, I didn't put the name. And uh, they can put multiple, multiple configuration uh, for uh, boot files in a single fit image. So you can ship a single boot image. They can boot on multiple boards. And you have a kernel and the device tree associated. You can sign it. So you can even do secure boot with fit image. So it's a great, uh, great feature for your boot. And uh, for the overlay support, you can apply the overlay before running Linux. Uh, because the overlay support in Linux is still um, in discussion. So it's easier to, to, put, to, to apply the overlay on the device tree in your boot. So um, in Linux, you, can, you already have the overlay directly uh, applied and uh, nothing to do. Uh, for the ARM64 ARM board, for example, which are supported by the AFE specification, it specified how to pass a device tree, for example. Uh, and uh, U-Boot supports basic EFI uh, for ARM64 and ARM, uh, and it can use device tree, so it's it pretty cool. So I will only cover the basics of the device tree. I won't extend myself. 
you can have a, a, a very good uh, support on all these uh, presentations. Uh, there's a good one from uh, Thomas Petazzoni, for example. Uh, if you want a formal uh, description, you can uh, look at the NXP document and the, the device specification, for example. And it's interesting to, to, lo to look at the power org uh, requirements to have a more understanding of where it comes from. So let's start. Uh, if you want more example, you can have uh, like 800,000 lines of the streams in Linux master, so you can redefine really everything you want. So it's the device tree use the device tree compiler, so named DTC, uh, to compile, com compile the, the device tree. So there is no, the fact of compiling the device tree there's, it's not comparable to GCC, for example. Uh, DTC only, only converts a source file into a binary file, and for example, uh, can put it in an assembly file, for example. But everything can be reversed. So you can take a binary file and output a source file, for example. So it's only a conversion uh, of, the, uh, of the format. So let's talk about a, a modern way to describe the hardware. So this is the SOC. So like the other uh, architecture, it's still very similar because in the SOCs, you still have a common bus, for example, connected to all the peripherals. So sometimes you have variants with the memory directly connected to the CPU, for example, or you have the ROM, but still it is the same stuff you still have a common bus, you still have peripherals accessible by, by um, as a bus, you still have the same adapters to, to, to talk to I2C and SPI devices. So this is why uh, the device tree is, is still accurate, because it's, it answers to the same issues we had in uh, 1995, 94. So, there is a concept of the flattened device tree uh, because the, the device tree can be it, it parsed and interpreted in a flattened way. So, for example, this is how it's stored in a binary way. So, you have this node described in a source file, which is a structure is similar to a C, a C uh, source file, and you have you can have described in, in a hardware in a binary form, a blob form in this way. So you. You have simply, uh, uh, the, the tree is uh, simply passed and, this, and, and, and outputted in binary form in the simple manner. So I already, I already told about the DTC, the official compiler, uh, maintained by uh, David Gimson and John Lowliger. Uh, I made the PyPython uh, device tree interpreter, which the prim primary goal was to load the binary blobs and, lo and uh, have um, uh, um, a native uh, object model in Python to add some properties, add some nodes, and uh, merge. You can even merge multiple blobs in one blob to and, and output a new blob. Uh, and uh, I can produce source, but Interpreting source is more complex because you need to, to write a front end, which is not the goal of my uh, Python library. Uh, Zephyr, which is a new uh, RTOS uh, baked by the Linux Foundation, uh, has a custom Python based source tree parser, for example. But someday I will maybe use it to make a front end to my uh, Python library, but I don't have time now. So. Um, let's talk about the source format. So how it's described, you have some nodes, which are, which are leaf, leaves of the tree, and you have, in each node, you can have some properties. So properties are only key value pairs. You, have, you can have some text, text strings, some cells, some 32 bit cells, some binary data, and you can even mix the different uh, type of values. So you can have a string and the 30 bit to bit and some binary and so on. You have a concept of a p, p handle. So 
it's like a, it's like a pointer. So you can refer, refer, refer another node from a property. So it's really handy to describe how actually the nodes are connected. So for example, all the interrupt and GPIO stuff, you can tell all oh, this pin, is, this pin from this particular GPIO controller is connected to this peripheral with some arguments. So you can say uh, this pin has these flags, for example, it, it takes only uh, level, uh, level values, the active low, and so on. This is a description of the, of the source file and the format. So you have the, here you have a main node. This is the main node at the top. You have the first subnode and two subset nodes. This describes all the possible properties with numbers, strings, byte data. Uh, the second full node has a property without any values. Uh, and here you have a p handle with parameters. So it refers to the another node with two parameters, for example. And this can be interpreted in the software to say, oh yeah, it's node two with these parameters. It's really handy. Uh, the way it's used, you can have uh, inc includes, so you can describe the whole uh, SOC family within the device tree. So you can have a SOC family, you can have an uh, SOC variant, a board family, and you can produce a board uh, device tree by including all these. All these. Uh, this is, for example, uh, an implementation we, I did for the analogic SOC, like my previous talk on Monday, uh, to describe the family and the board variant. So you have the family of the SOCs, you have a variant of, of the SOC, you have uh, for example, a node that is only on the variant and a, a specific package of the SOC. And you have a, as, a, as well a family of boards. And by including all this, you can have a, a description of a particular board, for example. This is really used today in a Linux kernel for huge SOC families. From the, for example, the Freescale EMXs have used that a lot. So what is the workflow to, to produce the binary blob used by Linux, for example? So you, you, use, you start from the DTS source file. Uh, originally, you only use DTC to, comp to compile it. But today, GCC is used as a, as a, as a preprocessor because uh, now in Linux, you can use shared include files between the source code and the device tree to have uh, some defines, some macros, to simplify the, um, the device tree, because having bare numbers, raw numbers, was really unreadable. So now you have some macros to specify, for example, the numbers, to, to describe the GPIO numbers, the interrupt numbers, in a more uh, uh, simplified way. Then you produce the data, the binary data. So it's called DTB for device tree binary and you give it to the bootloader that pass it to the kernel, for example. And in the step, the bootloader can also change the device tree blob. Uh, U-boot usually changes it by adding the, the MAC address, for example, uh, adding the memory size, uh, and you can add anything you want in the U-boot uh, command, uh, command uh, list, for example. And for example, your overlays can be uh, applied between the bootloader and the kernel to, uh, to simplify the, the usage. So, what is the future of device tree? Because uh, there's still a lot of ongoing discussions about the future. So, one discussion, a big discussion, is the overlay support. Uh, overlay permits, uh, permits to change the device tree dynamically on a running system. Uh, for example, the main usage is for the, it is for the, the single board computers like a Raspberry Pi or C2, where you have a header. The header with multiple pins are connected directly to the SOC, but each pin has a different, can have multiple functions. So you can plug I2C, SPI, a camera, and a lot, a lot of stuff. And you can plug some boards on top, which has different features different uh, ASCII devices connected behind. So 
the overlays permit to load, for example, dynamically some ISCOSI devices and some pin control uh, uh, functions dynamically and apply them. And you can even roll back and remove them and uh, go to the, and actually unplug and uh, plug, hot plug, hot deplug uh, board hat. So it works, but only the, the generic management was uh, upstreamed in the Linux, and uh, there is no generic way to load load uh, the overlay. There is some uh, very board specific overlay manager, like for the for the big open black or the Raspberry Pi that are upstream, but they're not adapted to a generic board. For example, for the Emergic board, we don't have any specifications on, on the hat. Uh, we only want to simply load the overlay and apply it. And there is nothing uh, today upstreamed. There is an old patch set that is uh, somehow maintained by different guys on the new kernels. But it's not easy to actually uh, leverage overlay support for some single board computers using mainline. So still in discussion, and I think we are far from finding uh, an actual solution. Um, it's a pity. So this is a description of how you write an overlay. So you only need to specify uh, uh, where you want to add or add something. For example, on the previous uh, slide, you have the node zero. So you only say, okay, I want node zero, and I want to add zip system node in node zero. And the, all the plumbing and the overlay uh, management in Linux will actually uh, add the node and we pass this node to, to for example, to uh, take into account the modification and uh, instantiate a new, new device, for example. So it's handy to, uh, to add support for new hardware dynamically. And uh, the device to compiler, the mainline one, doesn't support the uh, overlay support. It's only supported in some forks, uh, which are distributed, for example, by uh, for the Big Open Black, for example, and uh, Raspberry Pi. Sorry? Yeah. But still, still in discussion, is not really uh, uh, maintained. Um, other discussions, was not really formalized. Uh, other discussions about the West Tree, about using about U-Boot. Because you know U-Boot is, well, you know, U-Boot, there is the main U-Boot binary that runs on the DDR. And for a lot of SOCs, you need a SPL, a secondary program loader, which is a tiny U-Boot, which is used to load U-Boot. So you generate the same, the two binaries from the, the same code base. And uh, where you have the main U-Boot only using the VS3 to load all the, uh, the drivers, you still need to have a classic uh, C code to initialize all the SPL drivers, which is dumb because you need still have the, the C code backend. So there is in discussion multiple techniques to actually use, uh, still use uh, the device tree in SPL because you, today you can have very huge uh, device tree files, uh, multiple uh, hundreds of kilobytes, which is higher than the SPL code, code size. So uh, some, this, some techniques can be to grep the device tree to only take the nodes we want to use in the SPL. So you, uh, you can achieve like one kilobyte in the device tree. Or generate C headers uh, like Zephyr uses to generate a static C rep representation of the device tree. So this is still in discussion. It's not upstream at all. Um, this is also done on the Zephyr RTOS. So the Zephyr RTOS is uh, aimed for the Cortex M and equivalent CPUs. Even it has to support some Intel CPUs. So since it's a RTOS, uh, you need you can't have a 100 kilobytes device tree and a dynamic parsing of device tree at one time, because you can target some Cortex M zeros with like eight kilobytes of memory which is really small. So they use, they use the same technique as for U SPL. So it's in actual development, 
you can you described all the hardware in the, in the, the device tree, and they have all, uh, a pick a pick Python code to actually generate some uh, compute time uh, defined, some headers, and some structures to actually uh, make it static at build time. And they also use this device tree defines for the, for the build system CMake and uh, KiConfig, which is quite powerful. And with this, they can leverage the concept of overlays, even static. They can describe some board with some attached hats or some variants with overlays, which will be done at build time and not at one time. But still, it's the same goal in the device tree. It's to describe the, describe the hardware in genic fashion and not depend on the, on the, on the C code and a different C code. But for example, Zephyr will try to use the same bindings as Linux, for example, even if it, it, it will uh, be quite, quite hard to support the, the two of them. But it's the goal. Uh, there is some discussion about uh, describing the device tree in YAML, which is a, a more simple, more simple to parse uh, um, description. So YAML is a variant is a variant of uh, JSON in a more simpler way. So it's, there is more uh, there is a lot of um, YAML uh, parsers in. A lot, a lot of languages. So either you will find maybe one time some uh, device tree entirely written in uh, YAML, or maybe use it at intermediate format before, uh, before the binary format. Um, so why not? We're still in discussion. Uh, other discussions uh, that has been uh, discussed as the uh, they are at, in Prague uh, in uh, October last year. There were a discussion about, uh, in a diversity workshop in Prague about multiple subjects uh, turning around uh, diversity, diversity support. For example, uh, how to maintain the bindings between uh, multiple projects, between uh, FreeBSD, Linux, uh, Zephyr, and uh, Ubud, for example. Uh, how to have generic bindings, because of today, you have uh, tons of bindings, so the bindings describes the way you should write the node for a peripheral, for example. And you have nearly the same bindings for tons of peripherals, because most of peripherals only use one register map, one interrupt, one wizard control, and it's really the same. So the discussion about writing some genetic bindings that could be used across a lot of peripherals, uh, very similar in the way they are used by the CPU. Uh, another question was about du duplicating the V3 nodes, because in some, um, when you implement some camera support or some display support, you can, uh, you can you have uh, huge nodes, and when you have two or three main, same uh, components, we have two or three same times the same huge nodes for nothing because they only uh, change by maybe one interrupt number and one register address. So the discussion about maybe uh, doing some generic device three nodes that can only be changed by a parameter, for example. But you can, have, you can find more information about on the elinux.org device three future wiki page, which uh, has a summary of all the discussions uh, that were in Prague. So uh, I personally had an, an idea because uh, today you boot can use a binary format to store some uh, boot files, for example, and uh, why not uh, directly store files to, as a file system, for example, as a, as a static uh, with only file systems. So for example, I use my uh, Py FDT to actually uh, write the code to write a file system in device tree, and it took me like half an hour to do, because uh, generating a blob is easy. So the hard point will be to actually do the Linux driver, which is uh, another story, but still you have plenty of uh, libraries to pass uh, the device tree in, in, uh, in C, so it won't be really hard to do, actually. So it's on my to-do list one day. 
Here it is. Uh, if you have questions, uh, we still have, still have 10 minutes left until the next session. Uh, please wait for the mic if you have a question. Thanks for your talk. Um, what's the hold up on getting device tree overlays upstream? So can you uh, speak louder, please? What's the hold up in getting device tree overlays upstream? Uh, Do you want to talk about it now? We'll or? talk afterwards. It's a highly political subject. So <laughs> yeah, I'd like, I, I work on BMCs, and I'd like to use it to hot plug in the the parts of the system that only appear when the host process is running. And yeah. I went down all the steps to use it, and I'm like, oh, shit, it's not upstream. That's really unfortunate. Yeah. It is now? OK, I'll talk afterwards. Thanks, Dave. You mentioned there were two x86 boards that use device tree. Um, do you have any idea why they're using device tree? Uh, I didn't understand, sorry. You mentioned two x86 boards that are using device tree on your slides. I'm just wondering if you know why they chose to use device tree. Because for them, it's all OLPC, the one Linux per one laptop per child that use a open firmware. They they use open firmware to boot, and uh, some of the of the hardware is only described in uh, the device tree, not in uh, ACP tables. Um, it's not proper device tree support, but only uh, they added support to pass a few nodes. Uh, I'd just like to thank you uh, for the presentation. We, well, the project that I was involved in, used a Raspberry Pi 3 for development and then deployed on a Raspberry Pi 0 um, with some audio software. The Raspberry Pi 0 doesn't have the audio circuits on there, but with the overlays, we were able to like, push audio at the PWM with a single line of code. So um, it saved us a lot of time and effort. Yeah, overlay because it's a handy feature, but uh, it's still to be formalized, actually. Any more questions? All right, please join me in thanking Neil one more time. <laughs>